Good evening, and welcome to the History and Genealogy Virtual Classroom. Today is Wednesday, December 9th, and the time is 6.30. Thank you for joining us. My name is Mike Bridwell, and I, I will be moderating this Zoom session. Today's class, Digital Archiving and Preservation Basics, will be taught by Ellen Mays. This class will be recorded and made available on the St. Louis County Library website and on the library's YouTube channel. If you are viewing this Zoom webinar live, you are encouraged to type questions using Zoom's Q&A feature. The instructor will answer questions at the end of this session. I have put a link to the class handout in the chat. I will now turn this over to Ellen and we will begin the class. Thanks, Mike. Welcome everyone to this class on digital archiving and preservation basics. I hope that through this class tonight, you're able to get an idea of what to do next or how to get started with your digital archiving projects. So thinking about digital archiving, it is a process. So we're going to go through some of the steps of the process tonight, and then we're going to go into some detail about what uh, guides you can find and what resources can help you uh, during the digital archiving process. So the first step is identifying. So that's going to be deciding what you want to digitize and what you want to keep. So that also carries into number two, which is deciding. And number three, saving and exporting. Four, organizing. And five, copying and managing. So for this class, um, we're also going to talk about some of the basics of uh, different file types, what types of documents, and what types of materials you might need to uh, have or think about when you're considering archiving uh, your personal family records. So these could be photos or documents that you want to save that are important to you. So first you want to identify what it is you want to digitize. So for files, photos, or documents, um, you might consider personal family photo albums, personal letters, uh, any kind of um, documents that you could scan and digitize uh, and store that way. Um, consider if there's a particular person or topic or subject matter that it pertains to and whether it's a personal or work related item. Uh, also, um, be sure to check uh, with people if you have other people's records in your collection, you want to make sure that they're okay with you having um, copies that might have personal um, or private information. So definitely check with that too, especially if you're wanting to share uh, records or photos with other family members. So what types of records do you want to archive? So do you already have um, the physical original copies, the paper copies? Do you have digital materials, born digital files that you need to archive? And then consider what file types you're going to use and what you're going to need um, to help you get started thinking about the process. So the second part, deciding, um, archivists call this appraisal. So this is when you're going to decide what is our pr priority? Uh, how many files do you wanna keep? What do you wanna keep? Um, are these files you're going to wanna share with people? Meaning how many copies of the files are you going to need in order to share those files? Um, and also deciding um, what you can get rid of. If you have 100 copies of one photo, do you need to keep all of them? Not necessarily, but you also have to take into consideration things like the quality of the photo and um, how many of those you do want to keep if you happen to want to uh, share those copies with other people or send them to family members and things like that. So those are all things to think about um, during these first couple of steps of the archiving process. Step number three is saving and exporting. So there's a lot of discussion about what are the best file formats for digitization and digital archiving. The Library of Congress does have a recommended format statement um, that is current for the 2020-2021 year. And there's also a document by 
the Library of Congress on the sustainability of digital formats. So that goes into more detail about which file formats are going to last better and more likely to be used in the future and maintained and have uh, software that can read those files later on. That's an important part of the digital uh, preservation process, not just scanning your photos, but also thinking about what file formats you may need to uh, convert your files over to in the future to maintain access and readability of those files. So to give you an example of what this recommended format statement looks like, I have a link here that I'll take you to uh, what these look like. So this is the Library of Congress's website. And you can see there are different uh, versions of this that you can download. And it's quite extensive. So you can take your time depending on what types of documents or records you're working with. Uh, if you're working with text documents, audio, uh, pictures, photographs, um, data sets. Um, a lot of times when you're uh, working on digital archiving, you come across different types of materials. And it's really hard to memorize all the different features and um, what works best. So that's why it's helpful to have these go-to guides that you can locate to help you find that information, especially if it updates periodically due to the advancements in technology, which is a factor in digital preservation. So the sustainability of digital formats um, is this website here. And it's taken uh, the Library of Congress a while to develop this, but you can see there's tons of information here. And what you can do is you can find a specific format uh, that you want to learn more about or, or to um, find out how sustainable it is. So you can go to specific formats and there, you can see there's tons of information here again, but uh, a PDF file versus a TIFF file versus a JPEG file are all sorts of different information about that. In addition, you can also find out what people mean about sustainability and what types of factors to consider and look for. So this is something to look at. Um, if you want to read more, you can see there's a lots of information here. And the Library of Congress has done a lot of the work for you ahead of time. If you have a specific format of a file that you want to know more about, you can go uh, to a specific file type, such as the PDFA family, which we'll talk about a little bit more later on. And it'll give all of the basic information that you want to know for it. So it'll tell you it's good for long-term preservation here at the very top um, and give basic um, information about it. And then it'll go into more detail and give a full description of it and um, more details of how the Library of Congress is using it and how other institutions have also adopted the file or, or use it um, for their digital preservation needs. So for image files, there are a couple of uh, key terms that you'll notice people discuss a lot when it comes to digital archiving, especially photos. And some of those terms are compression, rendering, and compatibility. So compression means that each time an image is saved, the information for that image is encoded with fewer bits than the original, resulting in a lower quality image over time. So you'll hear uh, certain file types called lossy or lossless. And that means that certain file types are more um, are compressed and may lose um, information over time if you keep um, making a copy of that. So for example, a JPEG file is a lossy type file format. This means that if you copy a JPEG file, the first copy, will have the most information. Each time you copy that JPEG file and create another copy, each additional copy will have less information than the first one or the one before that. Now, lossless file formats do exist. There's also a more recent uh, JPEG file called a JPEG 2000. 
or JP2, and that's used a lot by um, large museums and archives and university archives, uh, but they're not as um, well used right now um, or widespread um, as far as using with commercial products. A lot of scanners that you have, for example, might not have that file format for you to be able to save it as, and some software programs are kind of limited on if on opening those files. So there's some um, things they're still working at to make um, the JPEG 2000 more user friendly for um, most people in addition to the, to the uh, professionals in the field. So for lossless files, uh, TIFF files are great for that. And I would definitely recommend that for the main archival copy of a photo to, um, that you save it in, as a TIFF file. Uh, we have a scanner here, for example, at our library that will let you select a TIFF, JPEG, um, or a PDF file as options for saving that file. So it's usually in the settings um, for your scanner. So you definitely want to look and see how your scanner works, how the settings are set up, and how you have to select those before you start the scanning process. Now, rendering incompatibility is also an important factor to consider. One of the reasons you might choose a JPEG uh, format over a TIFF file is that JPEGs are supported by all web browsers and by most programs. So if you wanna make copies of your um, archival copy uh, so that you can share with other people through email or on the web, JPEG is the way to go for that. Uh, because TIFF files are not supported by all browsers and programs, and they don't transmit over the internet as well. Fixity is another term you might hear in um, archival work or in preservation, and fixity is in um, the preservation sense meant to assure that a digital file has remained unchanged over time. And what um, you can do is there are certain types of tools, digital preservation tools, that allow you to insert a code or information to a file uh, that helps you um, make sure that, you, that that file stays, that, stays the same. Um, so whether you're sharing the file or making any changes to it, that will be kind of a track record for you to see uh, how it's changed or if it's the original file or not. Um, one tool you can use for this is uh, whereavp.com products. And this is one software program um, that's an example of what people can use to create um, a tag or items and uh, information that will be basically embedded into your file so that people can keep track of how it changes over time and what changes have been made to it and whether it is essentially the same file that you started with. So a little bit more information uh, for you about deciding between you, if you want to use a JPEG versus a TIFF file. JPEGs aren't bad file types to use, so I don't want to scare you away from using JPEGs. They're great for a lot of different reasons, um, but you'll also hear a lot of archival professionals talk about the uh, TIFF file formats for arch archival files and records like that due to um, the lossless compression and um, other things like that. And However, because they have a lossless compression, they also tend to be a larger file size. And they're harder to share, as I mentioned previously, especially over the internet, or if you want to email photos to someone, um, they can be harder to transmit that way. Um, but they are used typically by larger archival institutions um, that have more storage space. So if you're creating a personal family archive, for example, you might not have all the storage space that a large university might have. So um, considering JPEGs um, are definitely um, something to think about. The Library of Congress has a lot of great information on personal digital archiving, which is mostly what we're discussing tonight. Um, so uh, while you can save with low compression, um, they are ideal, again, for copies. And um, they're, again, uh, smaller and easier to share. 
for PDFs, uh, there, there is a, an archival type of PDF file. You might not have seen this as much because it's not as common to see on most PDF files. Um, this is an open format, and that's one of the reasons why people like using it, because it is readable by most programs. Um, and if you need to convert a regular PDF file into a PDFA file, there are some free online uh, converters that you can use. And there are a few here that I've given you. Uh, FreePDFCreator.org uh, is a great one. And uh, so definitely consider trying this out if you are trying to save a file as a PDF. If you need copies of these links later on, um, I can send them to you in the chat or send them in a follow-up email after the class as well. So don't worry about trying to copy down all the URLs. So for organizing, organizing is a really important step that people sometimes um, skip over because they're so concerned about finding the correct file type, which I totally understand because a lot of the emphasis on technology and digital archiving is choosing a format um, that will be sustainable and that you can um, migrate over into the next um, format that can continuously be uh, viewed in the future. However, you also want to have a system set up so that you can find your files and so you can organize them and you can share them. And it also makes it easier for you to create backups and have um, information embedded into your files so that you, when someone else accesses your files, they know what information is there. Or when you later on access your files, um, you'll have that information there with your file so you don't lose that as you're going through the digital archiving process. So for file naming, I have some tips for you. Um, these are common uh, suggestions by a lot of archivists, but I definitely think this is worthwhile and it's actually good um, to try it out um, on other files before you start trying it out with your um, most precious photos and documents because it takes some time getting used to the file format system for file naming. And some of the things to think about that um, aren't uh, well known is to never use spaces or special characters. So you can use dashes or underscores if you want to have a space, but spaces um, aren't recommended for file naming. You also want to try to use short descriptive file names instead of long ones. Um, and also include the content and date if possible. Um, I also suggest using a consistent method for naming your files. So if you have like version one or version two, um, use the same file format each time. So you have that consistent file system. There's also a suggested standard format uh, by the ISO, and that is um, year, month, and day. So for the actual folder system, um, these are helpful, uh, again, if you're trying to figure out how to organize your files. So if you have a series of files that you just named from the previous slide as an example, how do you structure them and, and uh, store them in a way that will be easy for you to find and organize as you go through, especially if you have a large collection that you're trying to organize. So I suggest using a folder within a folder directory style structure. So uh, the first thing is to consider uh, if you have a separate folder and what uh, files you want to store within that file. So if you have, for example, like this one on the screen, you have a My Documents folder and then a Family folder for a topic. And then below that, you might have a specific topic within that family group. So like a special occasion, like a wedding, and then all the photos from that wedding you can put in that folder. As you can see here with the file names, they've stayed consistent by putting the date first. So you have the first four digits as the year, the next two as the month, and the last two as the day. 
They've used dashes instead of just spaces. And then they have um, the, a brief description of what the photo is followed by a number. So backing up and storing your photos is one of the most important parts of digital preservation. So definitely want to think about how and where you want to store your copies and save them. So you want to save a, the highest quality scan as your preservation copy, probably as a TIFF file. You also want to make at least three copies. So store one on your computer and the others on different types of media, such as DVDs or external hard drives. You also wanna have a summary of your contents with your copies and store copies in different locations. So for example, if you have a copy at your home on your computer, send another copy to a family member in a different location so that you literally have copies in multiple geographic locations too, not just on different uh, media types. So a popular term and concept with archiving uh, in general, but especially with digital preservation is metadata. Metadata often sometimes people think of as uh, tags that people add to photos, but it's actually more uh, than just adding tags. Metadata helps you track any changes that you've made to a file. It also helps you describe the file and maintain all the information you have for, for the future. So a definition from the Society of American Archivists for metadata is a characterization or description documenting the identification, management, nature, use, or location of information resources data. So it's a way of describing your, your file, your document. There are different types of metadata though. So you'll have administrative metadata, descriptive metadata, preservation metadata, and structural metadata. We'll go through each type just to give you an overview of what metadata entails, um, but we'll also go into a little bit later on of ways you can add some of these um, important pieces of information to your files. So administrative metadata is data that is necessary to manage and use uh, for information resources, and that is typically external to informational content of resources. Um, it often captures the context necessary to understand information resources, such as creation or acquisition of the data, rights management, and disposition. It's generally used for internal management of digital resources. So it's not necessarily something that if, uh, for example, you were in charge of a university archive and you wanted to share um, information or details, it's not necessarily going to be um, all the description and details. It's going to be more for internal staff to recognize a file and to keep maintaining it. So descriptive met metadata is definitely something that you might add to your files, um, especially your photos, if you wanna keep track of the, who is uh, featured in the photos, any uh, locations, uh, distinguishing features and things like that. Descriptive metadata is information that refers to the intellectual content of material and aids discovering of such materials. It also allows users to locate, distinguish, and select materials on the basis of the material's subjects. So this is where you're going to add any subjects or topics, events, details um, that help explain the file. Um, in addition to the bibliographic information that's included, um, it may also describe the physical attributes of the resource, such as the media type, dimension, and condition of the file. Preservation metadata is also important. It helps you keep track of what has been done and what you need to do and what is uh, planned on in the future to help um, preserve it. So it's information about an object used to protect the object from harm, injury, deteriorate, 
deterioration or destruction. So it may be used to store technical information, supporting preservation decisions and actions, to document preservation actions taken, or ensure the authenticity of digital resources over time. So I mentioned the fixity uh, concept earlier. This is also where you can track some of those changes that you make to um, preserve the original copy. It also encompasses all information necessary to manage and preserve digital assets over time. Structural metadata is less well known, but it is um, just as useful and important as the other types of metadata. Structural metadata is information about the relationship between the parts that make up a compound object. So for example, if you have a book, um, it could help you understand the relationship between uh, the pages and the chapters of the book. So how the chapters relate to each other. Um, it's also, um, in instances of a resource in different formats, such as TIFF files for display, PDF files for printing, or OCR files for full text searching. So uh, keeping track of what other formats this um, object or document might be saved in will help um, for other uses as well. So when you're looking for photo tagging software, there are some things to look for. You wanna look for things that have a metadata editing option. So it allows you to input new metadata or edit any existing um, data that's already in, uh, on the image. Um, you also wanna consider uh, a software program that has the ability for you to resize or reformat the file or the photo. Um, also a tag editing option and any um, changing of data or capturing uh, camera properties options. So you wanna be able to change the date um, if you need to, or also adjust the camera properties. So editing uh, custom XMP schema data is also useful to look for. Uh, free downloads for photo tagging software are available. Some are uh, listed below here for you. Uh, including Photo Me, EXIF, Fast Photo Tagger, and Analog EXIF. An example of the EXIF data. EXIF data, if you hadn't been heard of it before, um, is called is um, exchangeable image file format, and these. This means um, details about when, where, and how a photo was taken, and it's data that's captured automatically by smartphones and digital cameras, and the data is stored as EXIF data. So there is a way for you to find um, the embedded data on an image. So if you go to this EXIF link, it will let you input a, an image uh, URL or you can choose a file, and once you select it, it will bring up all of the, the embedded data that's already in the image. So if you wanna check um, a photo to see if it already has or what it has copied over from um, the original scanning, you can check using uh, programs like this. And this one is freely available. You can Google image metadata viewer, or EXIF, E-X-I-F, and it will pop up for you as well. This is another example of a program that will let you edit or add metadata to a photo. This is helpful, um, especially if you have a large collection that you wanna edit and allows you to save files, import, um, and also create and modify dates and other crucial information that you want to save about your photos. This is a picture of what the program's interface looks like. It's called PhotoMe, and it's another um, open source software program that is available for 
you to use for adding metadata to your photos. So copying and managing. Copying and managing is also important. It's a part of the preservation process and it's also important as a good reminder with the unique aspects of digital preservation of what you need to think about. So do you have lossy files or lossless file formats like we mentioned earlier? Another good acronym that is often used in the archival field is LOX, and this is an abbreviation for lots of copies keep stuff safe. So you wanna have lots of copies in multiple places and this will help you maintain those records and files and the information. Um, data migration is important too, and this is when um, certain file types become obsolete. And it could be because the file type is, is no longer supported or the developer that created the, the program that allows you to read those files is no longer supporting that file type. Uh, so there can be different reasons for this, uh, but you wanna consider if any of the file formats you've saved your files in are in danger of becoming obsolete. And some of those resources um, I mentioned earlier, like from the Library of Congress about the sustainability formats, resources, um, and references are great to check if you are wondering or concerned about a certain file type that you're using. So an example of what you might want to use a PDF A file for is text files. Uh, so as opposed to photo files that we've been discussing, um, text files are a little different. And you're also possibly going to want to OCR, opti optical character recognition, uh, for the to use um, OCR for your files. So if you want to do that, that will make your files searchable. It does take longer to add an OCR to your uh, OCR capability to your file though. Um, so keep that in mind if you have a lot of pages that you want to scan, it could take a long time for you to OCR everything as well. So I'm going to go into a little bit more detail about the difference between a preservation and an access copy. A preservation copy, again, is going to be a high quality duplicate of the original. So you're gonna have the first preservation copy. Then you're gonna have a second copy, which is gonna going to be um, the preservation copy, which is separate from your master file, the original archival file that you created. Um, this is in the event that something happens to that original file that you created. And it's um, going to be in high resolution and high bit rate, as well as a file that has no or very little compression. So it's probably going to be in a TIFF file format if you are, um, working with a photo. It also will need to be an open or non-proprietary format so that you will still have access and be able to render the photo and read it um, and view it in the future. An access copy is an additional copy um, that is more useful for sharing and easy playback. This is also um, a copy that you can edit if you were trying to Photoshop your, your photos or edit them after the scanning process to improve it somehow or restore it um, or fix any uh, issues that you might have with your photo or your document. It's typically, typically gonna be a low bit rate. Um, so you have um, more storage space and a compressed file. So for editing, you also want to consider um, what are things you're going to do to keep your original files safe and how you can still edit the ones that you want to share. So you're going to have at least two versions, the master file that you work with as well as a working copy. The working copy is the one you're going to edit. The TIFF uh, file is going to be the master or the preservation copy that we mentioned earlier. The TIFF format um, is going to ensure that uh, the information 
is the same from what you took that initial time, that initial image of the file. The JPEG file is going to be used for the working copy or the, the editing file. Uh, JPEGs, again, will be easier for you to send through email and for posting online. So if, especially if you're editing your photos to be viewed online, um, it, I definitely recommend you use a JPEG format for that. So for scanning, uh, there's some things to consider. Uh, scanning is a huge part of the digital archiving process. However, digitization and digital, digital archiving are two different things. Digital archiving is the whole process that we're talking about, which includes um, deciding, organizing, managing, and um, preserving those files uh, in the future, meaning uh, making sure to uh, convert them over to newer file formats and then making sure that you have software and programs that can still allow you to view or read those files. But scanning is the digitization process where you're taking an analog or a physical copy of a photo and you're digitizing it into a digital file format. There are a lot of different scanners that are available for this. Um, and depending on the types of documents you have, you do want to be careful um, to choose a scanner that isn't going to damage your photos or documents. There are a lot of uh, scanners that don't have a cover on them so that it can be an open flatbed scanner and nothing is pressing down on your photo or document that could damage it. So for the scanner settings, there are some recommendations. These are from the Library of Congress. Uh, for bitonal, um, you want to use two-tone or black and white scans of text for documents. Um, grayscale is best for black and white photos. For maps, diagrams, or illustrations, you'll want to use a color setting. And most documents, if you're going to print them, um, you can use 300 dpi. However, for, for photographs, you have a couple of different options. Uh, if you want to enlarge them, for example, to 8 by 10, uh, the Library of Congress recommends using 400 to 600 DPI. DPI means dots per inch. You may also hear people talk about PPI, which means pixels per inch. The difference between um, dots per inch and pixels per inch is the difference between um, printing and uh, a digital image. So pixels uh, PPI means how many pixels are in the photo versus dots when you print it out how many dots um, are in your printout or in your photo um, so for your most important photos like the archival institutions um, you can use 600 dpi the only reason people don't use 600 dpi um, and are more likely to use 300 or 400 is if they're concerned about storage space they are much larger files and take up a lot more space on your um, hard drives. So definitely consider that. But if you have one or two photos that you definitely want to preserve and maintain um, and keep them, uh, then you can definitely have the option of saving it as 600 DPI. There are some wonderful guides online for digital preservation. Um, as it is a very technology driven topic, things change all the time. So I definitely suggest you continue um, after this class to search for other resources, take other webinars, take other classes, because things change and update all the time with digital preservation. Some of the great places to access information though and to get ideas and to find out what the experts are doing um, is to access some of the uh, guides created by universities and institutions. So for example, Purdue University has a library guide that they've created. It's on personal digital archiving, the basics. So this goes over a little bit of what we talked about with the basics of identifying the files you want, organizing them, making copies, storing them in different locations. So the basics of what digital preservation means and what it entails. It also talks about file naming 
and what you do and don't want to use for file naming conventions. But it also talks about some of the uh, things that digital preservation is not. So uh, you don't just save an item, for example, to a flash drive and it's preserved forever. You know, that is one place you can store it, but it's not going to work to only s store it on one device. Um, you don't, you do want to have files stored in separate locations um, in a place that is secure as well. You can save things to the cloud. However, I would not save your uh, main preservation copy on the cloud. You may lose access to it or you may lose a file. So you can share uh, the copies of the files that you've made on there. Um, it's a great way of sharing photos um, without concern about storage space, um, but don't use um, online databases as your main location for storing your archival copies. Another thing you can do if you're looking for ideas on digital preservation is to look and see what universities have done with their own collections. So let's go to Purdue University Archives and Special Collections. So let's look at their um, e-archives and digital collections and see what file formats and what approach they use. So let's try looking at Amelia Earhart at Purdue. So this here is a digital content management system that you're seeing that they created like a, an online catalog for their digital records. So they have um, images that they've uploaded along with the metadata that we were discussing earlier. So there are uh, content management systems that you can download for yourself um, that are similar to this. Um, a lot of uh, archival institutions use uh, tools like Archive Space and other uh, systems like Past Perfect to store their information and uh, organize it. However, there are some other ones uh, one I can show you later that you can access and they have uh, free trials and free downloads that you can test out as well. So the main image is here. So you can click on it and view it and see how they created this digital image. And then below we have the metadata. So you have an identification number. You might decide to do something like this if Okay, can you see the websites now? <laughs> I'll go back and show you the other ones too. Okay, so this, uh, as I was mentioning, is a example, an example of a digital archive that a university has created. So if you want examples of uh, how to organize your files or what um, professional archivists have done, you can use this as an example. So uh, you'll have the image here and then the metadata descriptions underneath. So it'll have a title. You can give a title and description and subject. Uh, all these uh, pieces of information are helpful to add to your photo. As you're um, digitizing it, you also want to add these tags. So you'll have a format um, here that you can see. So they've chosen to use a J JPEG format for this image. 
And we also have the resolution details. So we can see that this is a uh, 600 PPI photo. And we also have the date it was digitized on, the type of scanner that they used. So you can get a lot of data and a lot of um, ideas from these university collections as well. Okay, so the Digital Preservation Coalition, can you see this website here? You can put in the chat box if you're able to see it. Yep, okay, great. So di the Digital Preservation Coalition has created this online digital preservation handbook. And uh, you don't have to memorize the, the URL, although it's not too hard to remember is dpconline.org, um, or you can type in Digital Preservation Coalition into your Google and it should pop up as one of the first results. Um, you can download the handbook if you'd like, or you can just view it on here. Um, it is uh, helpful, um, but it gives, a, again, a lot of detailed information about the digital preservation process. Um, it also has um, other resources you can uh, access, um, other uh, studies and uh, things people are working on in the field to improve the digital preservation processes. So depending on what part you are in the process, if you're just getting started, if you're just learning about digital preservation, there are some basics here on how to protect, protect your data and how to start um, the basics um, getting started with digital preservation. There are some great videos you can watch where th that they've created um, about the process and how to digitize. But you can also go further and find out, for example, um, what institutions are doing and what large dis digitization proje projects they're working on as well. So the Library of Congress um, has started an, an initiative to help people get started with uh, archiving their personal collections. And that's why you can find so much information on the Library of Congress's website. Um, you can go to digitalpreservation.gov. However, the place for more um, information for uh, the everyday person who's just trying to digitize their personal collection is the personal archiving part of their website. And I'll make sure you guys can see this one as well. It's all good? Yes, okay, great. So this is the personal archiving spot on the Library of Congress's website. And it's great because it gives all the information in one place that you are going to probably have questions about. So things from how to scan your personal collections, um, an introduction to scanning, uh, what to do when you're first using a scanner, if you haven't used a lot of scanners before, or if you've only used uh, you know, your personal scanners um, that have you know, the basics, if you're using a more advanced one or one at your library, what uh, settings and details and information are you going to want to know about that. But they also have videos um, that are also um, interesting and fun to watch. Um, but with them being, um, you know, a huge library with a lot of experts, um, it's definitely worthwhile to consult some of their information and details. Um, but definitely take a look and see if there's something specific here for your needs. Um, for a specific uh, project you're working on. There's information on here also about digital video, websites, um, email. Uh, so it's not just about um, digitizing photos, 
but also about born digital files that you may already have. So how to archive your uh, digital files that you already are, have created and what to do with those and preserve those. Um, there also is information about preserving websites. So if you are developing websites, that can also be a great resource um, to consider as well. Okay, so there are a couple of great articles that um, are, I find, really helpful for two different types of things. So the first one I'll show you um, is about personal digital archiving and the basics of scanning. This is from The Signal. The, this is a blog um, that is published by the Library of, Library of Congress. They have all sorts of articles they write um, about on their blog and all sorts of topics related to digital archiving. Um, but this one in particular has uh, a lot of great information about personal digital archiving and the basics of scanning. And uh, it gives information a little bit, of, a lot about what we talked about today, um, but also like what the DPI and bit depth and resolution really means and why it's important to your photos. Um, they even go into more detail about um, what to do with photo negatives and how to treat those versus a standard photo that you're working with. Um, what to do if you're trying to enlarge a photo in size and how that affects um, the DPI, the resolution for you. So there's a lot of technical information here uh, that you can read more about if you really like all the tech information, the details, um, which is great to have a great overall view and a deeper understanding of what you're doing during the process. Um, but I don't want that to scare you away from starting to digitize your photos because it not only protects uh, your original photos, but it also is a way for you to maintain that collection for many years to come. And um, the other thing uh, I want to say um, before I forget is to don't throw out your original copies. So just because you've digitized something doesn't mean you should get rid of the original photo or the original file or um, document that you have. Definitely maintain those original files um, because uh, technology um, can change, it can go away. Um, so you definitely wanna have that original um, in your collection as well. The next article I wanted to show you um, before I take questions is one that's written by Denise May Levnick. If you do a lot of genealogy and family history research, you may have heard of her name before. She's known as the family curator and she's very well known in the genealogy field. And this uh, article talks about the seven uh, technology tools that you can use to organize your family history collection. And some of the things that she discusses are basic things that um, are free and web-based, such as Google Docs, how to use Google Docs um, to help you organize the information. Uh, some of the information, for example, that you saw on the Purdue's um, website on the digital archive there, um, has some of this basic information. So just because you don't have um, one of those um, content management systems downloaded doesn't mean you can't record this information uh, for your personal records and your personal archive. You can use resources like Google Docs um, or you can create a spreadsheet um, using Excel spreadsheets or even Google Sheets um, to keep that data uh, together and organized. There are uh, 
uh, programs, however, that you can use that are very similar to uh, the types of tools that are used by professional archives, um, like our archive space. This one here um, that she mentions, um, Recollector, is a system, uh, a software program uh, that costs about $49, but they do have a free trial. And it is a content management system that you can use to record your files, to share your files, to, to um, record the metadata and make sure all that information is stored with your uh, information, with your files. So this is what the program looks like. Um, you can see how you'll have an image file that's similar to how it was on the Produce website. It's not necessarily as fancy, but it gets the same um, idea behind a content management system. And you'll have uh, the ID number, so you can give it a number to uh, maintain the organization and your inventory for your archive. You can add the title, date, and other details as well. So this is just an example of what this program looks like. Um, you don't have to use this program, but I did want you to know that there are programs that are available for everyone to access as well to help them uh, create their personal archives. So you don't necessarily have to be a university archive in order to um, preserve your collection like one. Okay, well, thank you for listening to me. I hope it wasn't uh, too much. Uh, I know there was a lot of information. Um, so I definitely wanna take some questions right now, if you have any, and if you need to see any of those websites from earlier, um, let me know in the comments or in the Q&A section, and I'd be happy to take the time uh, to help answer your questions. Thank you, Ellen, that was wonderful. Um, I'll just mention that the first slide, uh, the first slide that we noticed it on was saving and exporting. And you had two links from the Library of Congress. Yes, that's correct. Okay, um, so these two uh, are the recommended format statement and the sustainability of digital formats. So you might actually just want to, or I can even share the links in the comments section um, for you to peruse later. Um, I'm happy to click on the links though for you to see them now as well. Uh, let me share it for you. Are you able to see it? Yes. Okay. So uh, there's an HTML version. There's also a PDF version and the recommended format statement Um, is a long detailed, as you can see, uh, document that the Library of Congress has taken to discuss all the different formats and why um, they're recommended for different types of documents or records. So if you're working with text documents, if you're working with photographs, digital photographs versus print photographs, uh, moving images such as videos or motion pictures, audio, uh, even if you have things uh, such as software and video games or even web archives. So there's information um, that is very detailed, but also user friendly in a sense that it will guide you to what you need. So the beginning is a little overwhelming because you see all of that detailed information but then when you get to the t to the tables it gets a little easier to find the information that you're looking for so the way they have it divided up is um, in this table where it gives the type of um, document and then the preferred uh, recommendations for how to preserve that and what formats and what you want to include, um, such as metadata, what they recommend that you include. Um, so if you aren't sure what um, all the metadata entails or why it's important, um, it'll kind of give you a good reminder 
for what types of um, documents might have certain types of descriptions that you want to want to include. So for example, a book might have an ISBN number, whereas a photo isn't necessarily going to have an ISBN number. Ellen, there was a question earlier. Uh, the question was, any more discussion on the cloud? Why shouldn't we use this for primary storage? Thanks very much, appreciate your discussion. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, iCloud, um, it's kind of um, an, a, an interesting discussion because it's definitely kind of a go-to thing where a lot of our devices now are basically default set up to do that for you. Um, and it's so easy to do that it's um, not something that you should be scared of doing, but it is possible that once something is uploaded that you might not be able to get it back or it might disappear, it might get deleted without you meaning to delete it. Um, so there are a lot of things that can happen once you upload something or to either a social media site or use the, the cloud. However, um, it, you can use it for storing uh, copies or if you want to share photos with your family, for example, that's a great method of doing that. Um, and especially because of the amount of storage space you have on there compared to um, other um, mediums for storing your, your pictures. Um, but I, again, I personally wouldn't recommend using that for your main preservation copy, but for your um, access copies and the ones you want to share with other people, you can definitely use things like iCloud. Does that help a little bit? It's more of a personal opinion on iCloud. It's not a negative opinion of it at all. It's just for um, preservation matters. Um, I'd prefer to have a local copy on like a hard drive somewhere on my computer as uh, my main storage method. Yeah, I would agree. Next question is, uh, are you limited in the amount of descriptive metadata you can use? I have not come across that issue. Um, and if you do, um, you can definitely create a separate Word document. Um, just make a note in the metadata where that is. Um, so that's always another option um, if you do happen to run out of space. Um, but I haven't run into that issue myself. Well, uh, if there aren't any more questions, uh, I'd just like to say thank you for joining us today. And we hope you enjoyed the class and found the information to be useful. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, one more. Could you please share with us the notes and outlines that you used in your presentation? It would be helpful if you could send it as a, a PDF or something like that. Sure, I'd be happy to. Mm -hmm. um, David, uh, if, uh, if, how would you, would you want to send it directly to him? Um, um, yeah, I mean, does, I think we have all your emails if you registered though. So um, if everyone wants to, we can send it as a follow up as well, but I can definitely take your email down um, and make sure you get that as well. David, I think you said. Yeah, David, I'll, I'll make sure we get your email um, and send you a copy. Oh, oh, so uh, the numerous people in the comments are saying uh, that they would uh, like to have it sent to everyone, it looks like. Yeah, three or four people now, so. Um, okay, no problem. So, um, as I was saying, we hope you enjoyed the class and found the information to be useful. Uh, if you have further questions or comments, please feel free to contact us. Uh, contact the History and Genealogy at 314-994-3300 or by email at genealogy at slcl.org. Uh, if you are watching this live, I remind you that this class has been recorded and will be made available on the library's website at www.slcl.org backslash genealogy and the library's YouTube channel. Uh, if you are watching this on YouTube, we invite you to like this video and post a comment below. 
Uh, and so this ends the Zoom session. And I want to let everyone know, uh, or I'd like to wish everyone a, a nice evening. And thank you all for coming. Thank you, Ellen. Bye. Thank you.